Hello and welcome to our POV viewers. I'm thrilled today to have with us Elizabeth Rahm, the composer of The Garden of Alice, which was, is going to be produced as a film project, a unique and first time um, initiative of Pacific Opera Victoria. And we're thrilled to be working on this piece, which was composed originally in 1984, premiered in 1984. And Elizabeth Rahm is one of Canada's uh, most prolific, accessible and amazing composers. Uh, her musical career um, begins really as, uh, as an oboe player and principal oboist in the Atlantic Symphony Orchestra and then working with the Regina Symphony Orchestra and chamber players. And uh, perhaps this explains the uh, incredible amount of woodwind and brass music that Elizabeth Rahm has composed. Before I forget, I want to just let our viewers know that Elizabeth's website, elizabethrahm.com, is a great source of information, not only about the composer herself, but uh, it provides links to YouTube videos of many of her works. So Elizabeth, thank you so much for being here. And um, I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about your career as a performer. Okay, I decided I wanted to be a professional musician when I was 14 years old. And I was playing in a community orchestra, I played Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and I remember after the concert, I looked at my uncle and I thought, I wonder if I can do this for a living. <laughs> and that was it. That's, that, that's when I decided. Uh, I went to Eastman. I went there on a full tuition scholarship and um, met my husband there. And uh, it, it just went from there. I, we both got a job in the Atlantic Symphony, principal oboe and principal trombone, which is very rare to have, to, especially an oboe and a trombone, to get a position like that. And, uh, and, and that we just didn't look back. Uh, actually, um, with the oboe playing, it reached the point by the time I re resigned from the Atlantic Symphony, I had three children. And we would tour a lot. And it was very, very difficult to, well, I, I felt like babysitters were bringing up the children. So I resigned. And my husband, Richard, got a job at the University of Regina and we moved there. Unfortunately, there was a very good orchestra there. So I was able to continue, but I had lots more time because it wasn't as full time an orchestra as um, the, the uh, Atlantic Symphony. And so uh, that's when I started composing. I didn't start until I was 35. Oh, that was gonna be my next question. So, because often there's a little bit of an overlap. So what, what, in, what inspired you to start composing? <laughs> it's kind of a funny story. Um, my uh, uh, the, the teacher, the composition teacher in um, Regina, wanted to write pop tunes. And so uh, this is before I didn't realize that women actually composed, if you can imagine. <laughs> there, weren't, there were no role models. So he, he decided he wanted to write pop tunes, and he would write tunes, and I would write words to them. And he even took them to Nashville, but they weren't interested. Uh. So he said, why don't you write an opera? And, uh, and I, well, okay, I'll write a libretto for an opera, which I did. This was the final bid, my first one. And I wrote the libretto, and a year went by, and he didn't write anything. And uh, I said, why don't you write the opera? Me? Write an opera? So I gave it a try. I took one of the arias, and I wrote the music, and I thought, is this what composing is? You just write music to go with the words in this case. So then I wrote the rest of the opera. Uh, it was produced by the University of Regina. I was very fortunate. And then CBC heard it and picked up on it. So that was my start. That's an amazing story. I, I, I don't know that I've ever heard of anybody whose first work was an opera that got produced. Oh, I know. <laughs> that's, that's really unusual. And um, your, your comment about women composers, I think is fascinating given the context of time because there are certainly even some female composers of the, of the Baroque period that are just emerging now. In, in, now. In, Recent That's years, right. we're hearing right. of them. So it's, it's like their um, their voices were suppressed for centuries, and now we finally are having access to their music. Um, so that's a that's a wonderful story. And I also uh, wanted to ask you, uh, as I said earlier, you've really enriched the repertoire of brass ensembles and brass players and woodwind ensembles. Um, was that something that you consciously set out to do? Now there's another story. Uh, we had a world world class tuba player in Regina, John Griffiths. Uh, he, was, he was a fabulous player, he was known all over, but he needed more repertoire. And after I wrote the opera, he came to the opera 
And he said, he wanted me to write something for him. Well, after that, soon after the opera, I got a CBC commission. And I ended up writing a tuba concerto, which again was very unusual, but they accepted it. Uh, I needed something to write. And, you know, I, I looked, I thought a tuba is a very powerful instrument. I, a lot of people think of it as kind of comical, uh, but it's not, it's very powerful. And I ended up uh, looking through Norse legends and I found the legend of Heimdall, which is actually, I, I think it's a, a, one of those video game heroes at this point. But I wrote it, uh, the legend of Heimdall and his Yaller horn, and uh, that was a tuba. And that's, that's how I got started. After that, John wouldn't leave me alone. <laughs> I, I wrote three concertos for him. He t uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Roger Bobo. He's, he's like the, an icon for the tuba. He was on the Johnny Carson show probably the first time. I think he gave the first tuba recital in Carnegie Hall. So uh, Roger heard one of my tuba concertos, and he asked me to orchestrate it to play with the Minnesota Pops Orchestra. And, you know, once you get something played by someone like Roger, then the, you're, you're on your way. So that's pretty much how I got started. And then, of course, my husband is a trombone player. So I wrote a lot of music for him and his friends, and it's just gone from there. Well, that's wonderful, because the works obviously are, are being played all over the place by by students and by professionals, it's, it's, it, it, it must be very rewarding to know that your work has legs. Now, um, I, I, you mentioned the final bit, which uh, according to your biography was uh, premiered in 1980. So uh, did, did, the, did, did the commission or the idea for the Garden of Alice, which was produced in 1984, did it, it, did it come out of the success of the final bid? Yes. Another story. I <laughs> love your stories. <laughs> what happened was the, the uh, because of the success, uh, Philip May, who was the uh, vocal instructor, he he actually directed the final bid, and he said, "Why don't you write a children's opera, and you know something we could take to public schools?" Well, of course, I thought Alice in Wonderland, perfect. And I started working on that, uh, and as I was working on it, you know, political or uh, politics and universities or whatever kind of took over and it took over the libretto it took over the whole thing and by the time I got to the end it was pretty Kafka-esque so um, they didn't make it a school concert which was fortunate uh, then uh, Ken Kramer who was the, the artistic director of the Globe Theater in Regina uh, his wife Denise Ball who you know I bet yes. Denise Ball is yeah she's in Vancouver uh, with CDC she insisted that Ken come to this concert of, uh, I did a, a concert version of it. And he said the last thing in the world he wanted to do was go to a modern opera concert. Well, he said five minutes into it, he was staging it. And he called me that night and said he wanted to produce it. So that's how I got it started. That's fantastic. And I, I, I think it's interesting that you mentioned the, the university politics and the things that are going around you. Um, what our viewers might not know is that, uh, for the most part, you provide your own text for yourself. You're like Richard Wagner, you write your own libretti. Um, and so you allowed it to kind of transform itself while it was being written? Yeah, it, it actually transformed what was being written. It just, I, you know, when I got into the um, croquet game, or croquet, yeah, croquet. When I got into the croquet game, um, something, somehow the way the queen insisted on her own rules, and the rule was that she must win. So uh, you remember the story, how the, the, um, the hedgehogs have run to get through the hoop and everything. And, and, and I thought, this is kind of like politics in a way. The one who is in charge, everything has to, to bow down to the one who's in charge. And this is what happened. And then, of course, the Jack of Hearts. When I got to the, um, that was kind of an inspiration. He had his trial. And one of the things is, it, it's not the evidence that matters. It's how it's presented. So the, the uh, White Rabbit is the prosecution attorney. And Queen wants to behead the Jack of Hearts right off the bat. But he says, no, no, we have to go through the proper procedure. Then you can behead it. Yes, that's really fascinating. And there's also something that you mentioned um, in your own e explanation about having the ending changed. Uh, and this, that we, we, we can talk about that perhaps, but I, what I wanted to um, ask you about is that you mentioned certain influences or certain quotations that are in your score. 
Uh, Mozart's Magic Flute, for uh, for instance, is one of them, and also Berg's Wozzeck. So that's quite a that, that, that's that's quite um, a, a extreme ends of influence. So I wondered if you would just talk a little bit, particularly since you came to composing relatively late in life, um, if you could say anything about the composers that you most admire or are influenced by. Oh well, I, I think every composer starts out with Bach. Okay. <laughs> he wrote oratorios. He didn't write operas, but everything about Bach is is amazing, absolutely amazing. And, um, just the way he uses his material. Beethoven's the same. The way he uses his material. The the composers I'm most influenced by are the Romantics, the Baroque, uh, earlier composers. Then, if you get later, I'm certainly influenced Prokofiev. Uh, there were many. There are many. I couldn't narrow it down to one except maybe five. That's, that's wonderful. Um, do you listen at all to any kind of popular music or jazz? Uh, my husband is a jazz trombonist. And so I, I hear, and my mother was a great jazz pianist. So I heard a lot of jazz in my youth and, and um, at home. Uh, the two, my two twin grandsons are now studying jazz piano and uh, guitar. They can read the charts. They're studying trombone with my husband. They're learning how to improvise. They're 11 years old. I should send you, it, actually, if you go on, you, you might be able to see something they're doing. I put a few things on YouTube, but um, I, I hear a lot of jazz. That's wonderful. Uh, the reason I mentioned that is because one of the um, ways that your music is described is accessible. And uh, you, you even mentioned a tone roll, the use of a, a, a tone roll in, Alice in, in, in Garden of Alice, um, that's the music for the Queen of Hearts. But you say, and I, I really like the way you put this, um, it, uh, of course I manipulated the roll so it sounds fine, but it was the thought that counted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, sometimes, you know, you, you're looking for, uh, I, I don't want to call it a gimmick. Uh, you know, some, Bach used to um, listen to other composers. He'd play it and he said that would prime the pump. So I need something to prime the pump sometimes. So I'll start with a tone roll. And, uh, and that's, um, uh, then I'll fix it so it, sound, so it doesn't sound too uh, esoteric. That's good. Now, speaking of, of priming the pump, uh, I, you know, I wrote a piece for uh, two tubas you know, a narrator called uh, Reckoning for Wounded Me. Yes. And I, I met with, it's, it's an, about, uh, it's a native subject in Wounded Me. And um, when I was doing research for this, I spoke to the uh, head of the, uh, let's see what they called it. Um, NEC, First Nations uh, University of Canada. And he was telling me about uh, dancing. In fact, um, you know, when they, I, I went to powwows and, you know, to see how, to, to get a feel for the music. And he was saying, how do you think we get our inspiration for writing the music? And of course, inspiration, you know, I, you know, I, I was trying to think of uh, thoughtful things. And he says, no, no, I look at the horizon and I see it go up and then down and there's a mountain and a tree. He said, that's how they get the inspiration, is, is the line from in the horizon. Um, but, um, I forgot where I was going with that. Just uh, inspiration. Uh, tell me what you asked me. Oh, I, I was actually getting, I think you've answered it absolutely superlatively. Um, but this brought up something in my mind too. This, this is your, you're uh, clearly concerned with and motivated by uh, social issues that you see around you uh, oh, yeah. that help shape the, the Garden of Alice. And I was fascinated uh, with the, um, the Wounded Knee piece with the narrator. Uh, did you write that narration yourself too? That's, because um, we're going to move down a little bit more to the to the Garden of Alice, but um, it seems to me that you're also a, a, a basically collaborative uh, musician and, and composer. Um, although you write your own texts, you will find yourself in opera, of course, working with uh, singers and actors and directors and scene painters and, and scene designers and costume designers. So do you enjoy that collaborative process? Uh I haven't really collaborated that much, if the truth be known. Uh, in fact, I, I was told at one point that uh, the directors didn't want the composers around, or the writers, because they got in the way. <laughs> uh, there's so many legendary theatrical stories about that, about playwrights yeah. being shut out of the theaters. 
that's right. So I, I have I can't say that I've collaborated. I've never really had a proper workshop, which is is unfortunate, I guess. But maybe it's not. I don't know. Sometimes I wonder if workshops are set up just to uh, change something that's already fine the way it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, and sometimes the old adage "too many cooks" applies. Yes, as well. Yeah. Uh, but you've you've certainly written a lot of pieces where people will be um, in a situation where they collaborate and exchange ideas and. Um, I wondered if that affected any of the work that you've done that's, on something like Garden of Alice. Yeah, that's how we got into it, was the end of Garden of Alice. Um, was, I, I wrote three endings in all. The first one, uh, Alice, they, they, she went crazy, and they took her out in a straitjacket. And Tracy Dahl, who is going to be singing this production as well, she sang the original production. She said she didn't want to sing that every night. <laughs> so I had to change it. So instead, and I think that the second version was much better, had the Jack of Hearts intercede because she had defended him in the trial. He represented reason, and she, she stood between him and the characters, and uh, then he stood between her and the characters so she could run away. That's how it ended. This new version, um, what happens is she is actually dreamy, and when she wakes up, all the characters become the characters in the hospital that the uh, attendants are helping her out. And I don't know if she has COVID. I'm not sure why she's sick. But um, she, they're all there. A little bit like Wizard of Oz. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. And then she looks out in, in out the window, and there's the garden. The garden has now been transformed, and it's beautiful. And that represents hope. This is what I, what I hope, <laughs> is that the garden will represent hope. That's wonderful. Um, I noticed another thing, uh, and it reminded me of a composer like Benjamin Britten, who was eminently pragmatic and practical, is that there are different versions of your pieces for, for um, reduced performing forces to make them uh, more possible to produce in, um, by companies or by, or by organizations that don't have um, unlimited resources. Is that something that you set out to do as well, to make your works more accessible? Um, for this particular piece, uh, Garden of Alice, I did that because I wasn't going to get a full performance. And uh, I, I thought, I'll make it a concert performance and, and cut the parts down to just four, soprano, alto, tenor, bass, uh, leave the orchestration the same. The orchestration at the time was very small, it was just piano and two percussion. And that was the performance, oh, and narrated to cover all the spots that weren't uh, going to be performed. And uh, that's the that's the version that Ken Kramer heard. And I also did that for um, Time of Trouble, my last opera. I, not only did I make it a uh, concert version, which uh, got rid of the musicians and just had organ and um, uh, piano, and I, I called that the oratorio version. And then I cut it way back, uh, the same thing as the narrator. So there, yeah, I make different versions. Uh, for more performance possibilities. That's great. It's very helpful for uh, for performers all across the country and all across the world. Um, now, ordinarily, uh, we have when we've produced um, contemporary work at Pacific Opera, we've had the wonderful opportunity to welcome the composer to the performances. But during these very strange times, I'm assuming that we will welcome you via Zoom the way we are now. That's so uh, we'll look forward to doing that, Elizabeth, and thank you so very much for this opportunity to talk to you and to introduce yourself to our audience. Um, we're looking so very forward to our, this, this production of your work, The Garden of Alice, and to welcoming you as well as Tracy and our young cast. Um, so enjoy the rest of your day, and thank you again for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And I'll say goodbye to everybody. Uh, from uh, myself, Robert Hollison, and from our composer, Elizabeth Rom. And thank you very much for joining and watching. Bye-bye for now.